Okay, so it's my uh, personal privilege to welcome to the Arab Center and to the Doha Institute friends and colleagues, uh, Mark Lynch, Gillian Schwedler, and Sean Yom, uh, to launch uh, a book like no other, really, a book that has attempted to uh, take stock of uh, what has happened in Middle East political science in the last uh, 30 or more uh, years. I'll just introduce our guests uh, briefly, and then I'll turn this over to them. Mark Lynch, of course, is professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University, and he is famously known as the director of the project on Middle East political science, POMAPS. Uh, he edits the Columbia University's uh, press, Columbia Studies of Middle East Politics, and the Monkey Cage political science blog for the Washington Post. He is uh, most recently author of The New Arab Wars from 2016. Gillian Schwedler is professor of political science at the City University of New York's Hunter College. Uh, her books include the award-winning Faith and Moderation from 2006, and most recently, the new book, uh, Protesting Jordan, which just came out from Stanford University Press. And Sean Yom is Associate Professor of Political Science at Temple University and Senior Fellow at the Project on Middle East Democracy. His most recent book is From Resilience to Revolution, 2016. Of course, the three are the co-editors of the book we are here to celebrate, uh, The Political Science of the Middle East. Uh, mm -hmm. Happy to also say that the Arab Center will be translating the book uh, into Arabic to make it accessible to an Arab audience. Uh, Mark will take it away, uh, and then uh, each of our guests will speak for something like 15 minutes, and then we will open it up for questions and answers. Go ahead, Mark. Wonderful, thank you, again. Um, first of all, I'd just like to uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, it's been, uh, it's a real honor to be here at the Doha Institute and the Arab Center. Uh, this is the, I believe, the third time that I've been here, and it just never fails to impress me what, a, what, a, what an amazing institution that you've all built here. Great research faculty, great programming. And it's the sort of, uh, it's the sort of institution that we at the Project of Middle East Political Science have, you know, we look for across the region, uh, groups that we can partner with, where we can work together, collaborate on issues of shared interest and shared concern, and it's wonderful to find one like that here in, in Doha. Um, this book, uh, The Political Science of the Middle East, uh, Theory and Research uh, Since the Arab Uprisings, is, as, uh, as Vassal said, a, a genuinely collaborative effort. It grows out of the Project on Middle East Political Science and uh, was an attempt to uh, tap our network of scholars uh, from the Middle East, uh, from Europe, and from the United States um, to try and genuinely take stock of what political science has accomplished, what it's learned, what it got right, what it got wrong um, uh, since the Arab uprisings. And I wanted to say just a, a little bit about the project on Middle East political science, POMAPS, first, um, to perhaps put this into context. So I founded uh, POMAPS in uh, 2000. 2009, uh, early 2009, um, with support from the Carnegie Corporation of New York and Social Science Research Council, Henry Luce Foundation. And the mission at the time was based on the general understanding that within the United States, and, to, and I think to some extent within Europe and the UK, uh, Middle East studies was generally seen as an exceptionally weak, if not failed, uh, field, a subfield within uh, the broader discipline of political science. Uh, systematically, uh, we encountered a very, very small numbers of political scientists working on the Middle East published in disciplinary journals. Um, they, uh, a, a remarkably large number of top research universities didn't have a single uh, tenured or tenure track Middle East faculty member on, uh, on their faculty. And, um, and in general, uh, area studies in general and the Middle East studies specifically tended to be looked down upon within the discipline as not sufficiently rigorous, as not engaging the same questions and issues which were of the concern to the, the center of the field, the power brokers within the field, the top journals, the top departments. 
more than that, we found that within uh, public discourse, within the public sphere, uh, academics were largely ignored on the big issues of the day, whether it was the invasion of Iraq, uh, the global war on terror, the, um, the treatment of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, virtually anything related to the Middle East, Academics might have had a lot to say, but they had nowhere to say it. Uh, there, they had very little success getting into the op-ed pages. There weren't very many journals uh, or public-facing platforms where they could publish. And so uh, I, with the help of a, uh, an original uh, steering committee, Elisa uh, Anderson, our next speaker, was one of the original seven, um, and uh, a number of people in this room, including everyone at this on this panel, has eventually served on the steering committee, we started from scratch and we began building networks to support uh, political scientists working on the Middle East. And we, have, we developed through trial and error a large number of different activities aimed at each of these problems. We focused on supporting junior scholars above all. Um, we uh, today, as of now, we do uh, 10 uh, bo uh, book manuscript workshops a year, nearly 40 uh, article workshops a year, all done virtually to uh, to save money, um, but also so that we can so that we can work with people from all over the world. We and we you, typically uh, we have 10 to 15 out of the 40. Uh, uh, articles will be scholars from the Middle East region, based in the Middle East region. Typically, three or four of the book manuscripts will also be. We don't have to worry about visas. We don't have to worry about expensive travel. And it's helped us to be much more inclusive. And our goal has been, from the start, to make sure that we're engaging with scholars from the region um, from, the, from the vantage point of equals, that we're all engaged in the same joint mission, and we want to help people. Amar, you've done this uh, several times. It's, it's great. Um, and the, um, so we also give small research grants. We do workshops in partnership with institutions around the region. The very first one we did was with uh, Professor Lisa Anderson at, at uh, American University of Cairo, six months after the, uh, after the Egyptian Revolution. Uh, we do four to six of these a year. I also created uh, the Middle East Channel on what was then Foreign Policy Magazine's uh, website. Um, did that for about six years and then moved it over to the Washington Post. Uh, and again, the idea was to give political scientists, specialists in the region, the opportunity to directly engage with, with the broad policy public. Um, and uh, again, we've ended up over the years, we've published literally thousands of the of these essay, of these uh, of these pieces in ways that we think have really helped to equalize uh, the space between academic and non-academic experts on the Middle East. Um, the Arab uprisings were obviously a transformative event within the region and the region's politics. It, they were also a transformative event for the political science of the Middle East. Um, it. They, they, eru they erupted or they emerged about two years after I founded POMEPS. And by that point, our platforms were in place. And it meant that we were able to support scholars both to write about the, what was happening. Um, in the Middle East Channel, um, we, we won a national uh, digital magazine award for our coverage of the Arab Spring that first year. Um, but also, we were able to support junior scholars who were here in the field, scholars from the region. And for the first time, really, in a very, very long time, the mainstream of the field suddenly cared what we were doing. They suddenly were interested in this eruption of revolutionary popular mobilization across the region and the outcomes of those mobilizations. And they turned to us for answers. And I think that the, one of the purposes of the book was to show that we, as a discipline, as a subfield, answered that call and produced a remarkably rich, wide, and diverse um, set of publications, um, both articles and books, which really shed great insight onto uh, the events. And you'll hear uh, from my colleagues, my co-editors, Jillian and Sean, um, uh, about the chapters of the volume and, um, and, the, and, um, and the breadth and depth of what we as a, as a field accomplished. A couple years ago, we decided it was time to take stock. Ten years after, we decided it was time to kind of be able to look at this and to say, you know, 
in that initial surge of enthusiasm, we got some things right. We also got some things wrong. I think everybody in this room knows that a lot of us got swept up in our enthusiasms, and uh, we probably prematurely accepted things as permanent, which were not. We coded things as success stories, Egypt, for example, uh, which turned out to not be. Um, we uh, believed that, for example, the wall of fear had been broken forever, and there was no going back only a few years later to see that wall rebuilt and, uh, and considerably uh, more fearful than it was before the uprisings in places like Egypt. Um, 10 years was enough time to see what was transient and what was permanent. It also gave us time to reflect on some of the early assumptions. So for example, one of the notable things early on uh, was that you did not see large scale uprisings in countries such as, in countries which we hypothesized were ones that had recently gone through violent internal civil wars, Iraq, Lebanon, Algeria, Sudan. Um, with a retrospect of 10 years, we were able to see that that, was, that judgment was premature, as all four of those countries almost simultaneously erupted in their own protest movements uh, seven, year, seven or eight years later. So the, the, we assembled a group of nearly, I think the initial a group was nearly 60 people um, to come together and uh, discuss this en masse uh, and to kind of see how we should approach it. We ended up forming 10 working groups. Um, and those working groups were very much a collective decision as we all talked among ourselves about what issues we should discuss, what, it, what were the major clusters of research, the major thematic clusters um, that, that had emerged in that time period. And then we populated each of those working groups with between four and six uh, scholars, paying really careful attention to making them diverse in every way, um, diverse in terms of methodological approach, in terms of career stage. So we had every group had senior scholars and junior scholars, some of them even PhD students at the time, um, and some of them quite senior indeed. Um, we uh, made sure that there were, there were scholars from the region, scholars from Europe, scholars from the United States. We wanted to make sure that we were not going to produce groupthink, uh, where people would simply pat each other on the back. And then we, we set them free and let them argue and deliberate amongst themselves and figure out how they were going to approach this. And then we reconvened at another conference where they, they presented their original findings. And every all 50 people of, of who ultimately participated read and commented on every single chapter with an eye towards finding commonalities and differences across the chapters. So for example, if uh, the international relations group was talking about cross-border interventionism, and so was the group on militaries and armed violence, were they saying the same thing or were they saying different things and why? Not attempting to come up with a single common argument, but to really tease out differences within literature, similarities within the literature, and what were the underlying assumptions and reasons why people were agreeing or disagreeing. Ultimately, then, we got our final chapters. Uh, Sean, Jillian, and I edited, the, edited them uh, quite extensively. On a parallel track, once we had all 10 of these chapters, we handed them all over to the maestro, uh, Professor Anderson, uh, who graciously, as a uh, well, as an eminent scholar in the field, we should not say senior, um, agreed to um, reflect on this from the perspective of her time in the field. Uh, as I think some of you know, she wrote uh, several uh, quite influential retrospectives and reflections on the field of Middle East political science over the years. And she was able to read the chapters and produce a conclusion um, to the volume. And now it is available for you all to read. What I'd like to do is to hand it over first to uh, Jillian Schwedler and then to Sean Yom to talk about some of the chapters with which they were particularly intimately involved or found especially interesting. And then we'll come back to me and I'll do the same. And then we'll open it up for discussion with the group as a whole. Jillian. Thank you. And I want to thank also echo the thanks to the Doha Institute and especially the Arab Center and uh, its directors and Bethel for making this possible. Um, 
I'm going to talk about three chapters, but I, before I do so, I wanted to mention a bit about the scope, which Mark uh, mentioned briefly. One of the richest things for me about this project was it really got me out of my specialization and to look at, to sort of stand back like you do in graduate school and read really widely across the literatures and what's the state of what's happening. And I got to see a lot of connections and synergies that I hadn't been aware were being developed in these other areas because I was in my own uh, specialization. So I really commend the volume. Um, for that vision, the sort of ability to see the state of the art, the state of the field. And also, it's not just a stock taking, but the chapters really highlight important areas for future research, um, where we think there's really promising areas and a lot that can be done. Um, also, as Mark mentioned, the authors decided the focus. And so the chapters I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to tell you the subject that we gave them broadly and then how they decided to interpret it, because I think that was quite telling as well. And the chapters don't all have a unified vision, because there's multiple chapters. Some chapters have different takes on authoritarianism or other topics, and that's represented there too. And I think that's part of the richness is we're not trying to agree on a single vision of priorities or theories that are the best. Um, so the chapter to which I contributed was a chapter on protests. Um, and we were given the scope of, you know, the uprisings happened, so you're all working on uprisings and protests, all the contributors. And we decided not to take the uprisings as a unit of analysis to explain, because we collectively, the group of authors, were frustrated with the ways in which a lot of people studying the uprisings started with Mohamed Bouazizi and then look at the scope of a particular uprising until it failed or succeeded. And you line those up against each other and you say, how come Tunisia succeeded? How come this one failed? How come these just deteriorated into civil war? Not that that's a bad framework, but it's such a limiting framework and it leaves out so much. It leaves out a lot of things that happened beforehand existing patterns of protest and resistance that continued but escalated during the uprising period, um, the ways in which activists were continuing to protest long after some analysts were saying these are failed revolutions, while there's still, for example, hundreds and thousands of Egyptians on the street. So we wanted to sort of get away from that framework. And we chose the, the theme of protests um, in that regard. And we focused on uh, the fact you had this major wave of protests that attracted attention in the uprisings. Uh, they never really stopped, and then you had a second wave in 2019 and ongoing. Uh, and so we take stock, which I'm not going to summarize, but we took stock of the existing theories uh, in contentious politics, in the field of social movements, and in the field of protest studies, which overlap, but they're different literatures. They're not identical literatures. Um, and uh, we really, as I said, we wanted to push against this success-failure priority in a lot of the literature where you, you take the different uprisings and you stick them in a column and you decide, you know, how come only Tunisia succeeded. Uh, so we wanted to push against that. We wanted to push against the sort of seeing cases as compartmentalized as these sort of standalone units, et cetera. And so we uh, came up with three main areas after surveying the literature. So there's a really rich literature review. Um, all of the chapters have really rich literature reviews. So it's a great go-to starting place on a topic to see those citations to give you places to start. So we focused on three areas of innovation. Um, one was the role of routine protests or non-big event protests. Those are, there's protests across the region all the time. They might be small, they might be to do with labor, they might to do with women's rights, to do with uh, how come I don't have water in my neighborhood, why isn't there a cell phone tower in northern Jordan, et cetera. And so there's all kinds of protests that take place, and so we wanted to bring the sort of small event protests into view and see what they tell us. The second area um, was to look at the affective dimensions of Pollock. So affect in the sense of the emotive element, the atmosphere, the feeling in, say, for example, those first 18 days in Tahrir, that, oh my gosh, something new is possible. You know, people were looking at things like they couldn't believe it. Um, and the effect, Tunisia and then Egypt and then the Cascade had across, across the region. So that sort of the role of emotions, the role of fear, the role of joy, the role of depression when things are going wrong, you know, the role of all of these um, affective issues. And so that was our second main focus. And the third was to look at um, uh, other kinds of outcomes besides the success or failure, besides whether protests accomplish what they're aiming to do, what are the observable political effects? So for example, does it create ongoing political space? Even if the regime didn't change, was there ongoing 
political space? Was there less political space? In what areas? Did it change patterns of repression? Um, and so we really focused on these three issues uh, in that chapter. Another chapter I want to talk about, uh, which I think was quite interesting, was they were originally charged with talking about uh, refugees and the refugee issue. And they came back to us and said, you know, the refugee issue isn't a single issue. There's actually, if you look at migration and displacement in a broader sense, the refugees are just one part of this picture. So they reframed their chapter to be about migration and displacement. And they're examining diverse forms of uh, population movements, um, voluntary as well as forced, within and across the region, into other regions. <laughs> so the international, interregional, labor migration, forced migration. And they're really arguing that if we engage differently with this history of migration in the region prior to the uprisings, we really see the like, a movement of people quite differently than simply you know, there's a crisis or a war and this population moves and we're not seeing these other patterns. We're not seeing the patterns of how states deal with movements of populations. So the refugee crises, are, again, aren't in a vacuum with states are already dealing with population movements. Um, so they go back and look at patterns from World War II and the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, forced migration over the decades, uh, Greece and Turkey's population exchanges, Zionism and the expulsion of Palestinians, and so on. They also have a really important discussion of the ethics of um, research on migrants and refugees, and particularly the extent to which a lot of researchers saw these refugee populations and parachute in and interview them for a couple weeks and ask them about their trauma and then leave. And they've got quite accustomed to this routine re-traumatization in talking to researchers. And as uh, Sarah Parkinson um, uh, wrote in a recent chapter or uh, article as well, um, the refugee populations actually get accustomed to what people are asking. And so the data we're getting from them might not even be good data because they're responding to what they think we want to hear. And so they raise these really interesting questions uh, that I think are quite important. And they go on to discuss um, you know, conflict and migration, labor migration, state level governance and migration, not just crises, but the sort of ongoing state policies and the impact they have. Uh, questions of global governance and international institutions, um, the ways in which some governments uh, encourage other governments to accept or not accept different population flows, refugee as well as migrant labor, and finally the relationship between diasporas and different <coughs> states. Um, the third chapter I want to talk about was also interesting. It's uh, local politics. And they uh, came to this common um, argument that the local politics sometimes is looked at as subnational politics, right? It's, it's a window and it's a, lo a local version of things happening on the national stage. And they really wanted to think, uh, we need to do more than just use, think about local politics as making sense of national politics. Uh, and they're worthy of theorization in their own right. Um, so they look at protests in mining towns, the dynamics within certain neighborhoods in an urban city, refugee spaces, and so on. Um, they, they argue that the, this literature also strongly uh, builds on the spatial term in, in political science, uh, drawing on geography, urban planning, uh, and the various diverse theories uh, in those fields, uh, which have been brought into political science in the recent years. Uh, and they're using these new epistemologies and analytic focuses putting themselves, I think, really at the cutting edge of local politics. Um, finally, the chapter shows how this new approach not only advances our understanding of MENA politics, but it actually enriches broader uh, approaches to the study of comparative politics in general. They introduce conceptions of multiple scales, materiality from critical political geography. They examine <laughs> detailed empirical examples of how local politics operate and are produced, navigated, negotiated, contested, challenged, and so on in sum, how local power is reshaped in ways that illustrate how the MENA region, again, is not at all exceptional. And so the whole book is trying to sort of, again, uh, push against the um, exceptionalism that still, unfortunately, lingers in a lot of the scholarship, less our scholarship, but in the, the political science uh, in the West in general, uh, and push against that. And so the last thing I just want to emphasize that Mark, uh, I think, mentioned briefly, but I think it's worth um, uh, reiterating is that this effort through POMAPS and the APSAMENA, the American Political Science Association, 
MENA workshops have been to engage with scholars in the region, to not just bring them in and network them and find what resources they need, but also to let them generate you know, theories and approaches so it's not all coming from the West. And really, these chapters all have scholars from the region for that particular purpose, to make sure those voices aren't just heard, but are at the center of directing agenda, research agendas and suggesting what, where we should be pushing forward. And I think that's a quite important contribution uh, of, of the volume. So I'll stop there and pass to my colleague, Sean. Great. Thank you, Jillian. And I want to echo my colleagues in thanking the Doha Institute and the Arab Center for hosting us uh, and for allowing us to speak on uh, this project uh, at length. Um, I share, obviously, the sentiments of my uh, co-editors for this volume. It was a exhausting but richly rewarding undertaking, and one that we hope provides a critical inflection point in how we think about how knowledge accumulates and how social science, and political science in particular, is done uh, in the region. One of the things that comes out in the work of all of us through the POMEPS network, and more broadly in the West, um, and it's increasingly tilting in this direction, is a desire for more collaborative undertakings with uh, regional scholars and academic institutions um, in the Middle East and North Africa. I think beyond territorial boundaries and across oceans, one of the things that we all share as a scholarly community studying politics in the Middle East uh, is a close commitment to theory, because we are all of the ilk that we can describe things on the ground, but we also know that there are puzzles that have to be answered, important puzzles about states and societies and economies that we need to get traction and understanding. We have a close commitment to the regional context, because there is a living human terrain upon which politics and economics transpire in the modern world. It's not jumbled bits of data just rationally organizing themselves. And we have a close commitment uh, to our methods, to understand, to collecting data and information, and understanding how it all fits together to explain the theoretical puzzles we see on the ground in close context with the communities and the populations that we are trying to engage in real time. Uh, and those three interlocking contexts, I think, uh, come together in three chapters that I will briefly discuss uh, now uh, that uh, are, are also in the volume and that which raise, or rather append and radically interrogate three very commonly asked questions about Middle East politics by other political scientists outside the region and which the volume quite expertly subverts. So think about the following three questions. Why is there so much authoritarianism in the Middle East and North Africa? Right, that's a question of regimes and democracy or <clears throat> authoritarianism. <coughs> Think about the second question. Why is the Middle East and North Africa so economically underdeveloped? And the third question, why is there so much sectarian conflict? So in mainstream political science outside the region, it's not hard to find these questions being asked in the corridors of conferences and whatnot. What our chapters do is radically subvert them. So we don't ask, why is there so much authoritarianism in the region? We say, given that there is so much authoritarianism in the region, how has it changed over time? Because to be stable does not mean to be static as a state or a government. Apropos economic development, we think the appropriate question, and our chapter on political economy engages this, the appropriate question is not, why is there no Arab South Korea? Why is there no economic OECD success story in the Middle East and North Africa, in a, a, for, particularly for countries that don't have natural resource wealth? The real question to ask is, given all that we know about economics and political economy, where should the region be? And what are the concrete factors that are holding specific countries back from trajectories of growth and development? And apropos the sectarian question, right? the subversive, the subversive interrogation we offer is, what do you mean when you say sectarian? 
right? Because that's such a floating signifier, a fuzzy catch-all concept that becomes meaningless when it's used carelessly. So in the next few minutes, let me break down these radical inversions of these commonly asked scholarly questions which our chapters undertake to show the traction that we get by marrying our commitments to theory, to context, to data, and to uncover new frontiers of knowledge. So think about the authoritarianism question. Most political scientists unfamiliar with the Middle East identify the post-Arab Spring decade as a decade of authoritarian consolidation. Dictatorships are being renewed, autocracies are stable, democracy is waning even in so-called success stories like Tunisia. But one of the things that our dedicated chapter on authoritarianism does in the book is ask, the real puzzle is not that authoritarianism endures, because authoritarianism endures in a lot of regions and countries in the world. Russia, China, and four to five dozen other countries, which show very little signs of democratizing. So it's not exceptional in that regard. The real puzzle is how are non-democratic regimes reconfiguring and adapting to changing international winds and institutional constraints so that in their eyes, they appear to be more survivable, that they have higher prospects for success. So some of the wrinkles that we unfurl in the chapter include for the fact that unlike mainstream political science theory that tells us that the winning formula for non-democratic rule in the modern era is to anchor a regime in a ruling party, a hegemonic dominant party, like a communist party, i.e. China and other cases. We've seen a counter pattern in the Arab world uh, plus Turkey uh, in the last decade since the Arab Spring. That counter pattern is a resurgence of what we would call personalistic rule, in which regimes center around cults of personality, rulers centralize incredible amounts of power within their singular offices, and they don't bother building institutions like parties. Now, mainstream political science tells us this is a highly irrational losing strategy. Because statistically speaking, party uh, regimes anchored in a ruling party last longer. So why then would certain, uh, certain regimes, such as those in Egypt and Syria uh, and Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Algeria before its uprising in 2019, why would a non-trivial number of countries and political systems willingly reconfigure themselves to embrace a strategy that conventional wisdom tells us is suboptimal? It's a losing one. And that's one of the puzzles that we try to tackle. And what we find is that oftentimes, when new rulers come to power and institutions are in flux, the rules of the game change completely. And predominant theoretical frameworks borrowed from outside the region aren't always helpful in predicting what a new president or crown prince might do. So let me move on to another chapter that we, uh, that, that, that we uh, engage in the book, which is the chapter on the political economy of development. So for most political ec uh, economists, the predominant question that haunts the study of the Middle East is the question of relative underdevelopment. That there is a feeling that the Middle East and North Africa, excepting obviously the wealthiest Gulf uh, oil exporting states, should be either more equal or more prosperous or more productive than what they really are. And if you think about the last 50 years of scholarship by political scientists and economists and historians, there is a bevy of variables that have all been raised to explain underdevelopment. Colonialism, youth demography, gender inequality, conflict and war, Western interventionism, Israel, geopolitics. These are all common answers. Now, one of the things that the scholars that we uh, collaborated with to write this chapter uncovered, however, is that we need to be very critical when we ask questions like, why is the Middle East and North Africa underdeveloped, and be more explicit by, by, by stating what, where should the region be in terms of development. Because in many cases, it's not clear 
that the most common factors often cited as barriers to growth are actually holding back growth or causing instability or doing the things that conventional theories tell us. So as one example, think about neoliberalism. For neoliberalism obviously has gotten a very bad uh, reputation because with the onset of neoliberal policies in much of the Middle East and North Africa since the 1990s, social spending has diminished, poverty, um, perhaps not extreme poverty as our colleague Steve Heidemann told us in his public lecture yesterday, but marginal poverty has increased and in general welfare safety nets everywhere are declining. But as some of our scholars in this chapter ask, is neoliberalism really antithetical to economic growth in every context? They point to, for instance, cases like in Latin America where there are countries which have combined neoliberal adjustments with sustained economic growth. They also point out that the losers in many cases, not all, but in many cases of neoliberal economics, such as workers and peasants, were actually not on the front lines of most of the Arab uprisings. So where do we find them? And that's their point, to understand fully how certain barriers that we take for granted hold back under development, we need to be clear on what development means and the relationship between those theories and ordinary voices on the ground. And the last thing that I'd like to discuss, the, the third chapter that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that another, a third chapter that comes in the book is a chapter, uh, a very didactic, important chapter on sectarian conflict, which uh, our colleague here, Basel, also was one of the co-contributors. And this is one of my favorite chapters, because one of the things that this chapter takes to task is this incessant notion among not just Western social science, but even among a good number of voices from the region to think about sectarianism and the term sect or sectarian, right, Taifi, as a fixed, unchanging, essential notion or unit of analysis. Because as Basel and his colleagues all tell us, that is clearly not the case. It's a fuzzy term. It can be instrumentalized. And before calling a conflict or institution as sectarian, we need to know the context by which that term is being manipulated. So for instance, why, when the Egyptian or Bahraini government use the term sectarian, is that a bad thing? But conversely, sectarian means something very different it's a productive term in Lebanese politics. Why, in 1962, would the government of Saudi Arabia support a Zaydi Shia monarchy in the Mutawakkil Kingdom of North Yemen, saying that this monarchy is brethren with the Saudi monarchy in 62? And 50 years later, that same government is waging war on the Houthi movement, a Zaydi Shia movement, arguing, as its ulama did, that the Zaydi Shia are, in, in a very sectarian way, fundamentally fundamental unbelievers who don't have a role to play in political order. How in 50 years do concepts like sect and difference in identity change? One of the things that our colleagues tell us in this chapter is that we need to go deeper than, than the level of abstract conceptualization. At the micro level, we need to know when ordinary people value certain parts of their identity more than others. When does an ordinary person value religion or community or tribe more than other relative components of their identity? And at the macro level, when do we see resources and institutions and conflicts erupt not over perceived differences, but over the constructions of those differences to amplify pre-existing uh, grievances or pre-existing um, pre dissonances between people. These are the kinds of subversions and I think productive interrogations that the chapters of our book offer. Um, they, they add on to, I think, knowledge about the region. They link together the work that we all do as a global community of Middle East scholars. And I think we are all embarking through the book and through our own regional collaborations on the same task, which is how do we make the events of the region more legible to other scholars and as scholars ourselves, how do we explain them more precisely in ways that are loyal to 
uh, the data and the context we see, but also rigorous in the ideas that we invoke. And we hope that the book uh, provides a small step in the right direction. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sean. Um, so let me uh, very briefly talk about um, uh, four, uh, the other four chapters in the volume. But first, I just wanted to say that, you know, I, ho I hope, as I hope is clear from the summaries that you've heard from Jillian and from Sean, these are not simply, these chapters are not simply meant to summarize and contain everything that's been published on these topics. They're quite selective in terms of trying to provide what would ideally be a great um, a way for graduate students to prepare for their comprehensive exams. Um, so that, that's one thing we're hoping they'll be able to do. But also to approach them in ways that are largely symmetrical across the chapters. So for example, all of the chapters um, are in some way looking at how history matters, uh, looking at kind of the long durée and placing the events since the Arab uprisings within that longer context. All of the chapters de-exceptionalize the region. They all uh, engage in cross-regional comparisons, looking for ways in which you see either common uh, or divergent paths between the Middle East and other regions of the world. Um, uh, all of them, uh, or not, well, not all of them, most of them uh, engage in some way with core questions that are cross-cutting themes that we decided not to have chapters of their own. For example, gender uh, or the role of media and political communications, which affect virtually all of these thematic clusters that we've talked about. Um, and so the chapters that I'll talk about, uh, the first of them is on international relations. And um, here I'll just mention that there's a, a number of ways that we, uh, that this chapter approached international relations. Uh, the first is from a quite classic approach, which would be to look at the changes in global system, the real or perceived decline of U.S. hegemony, the rise of a more multipolar international system, and the effects that that has on uh, the patterning and the dynamics of a region which has been largely built around American primacy uh, since at least 1990. Um, and Within this context, it looks at shifting balance of power and uh, alliance patterns across the region, which I think we've all seen have, we've witnessed quite rapid changes in alliance patterns and, align, and alignment behaviors. Uh, everything from the rise of, for example, the Emirati-Saudi axis um, and their interventionism across the region, uh, Qatar and Turkey and their interventionism across the region, playing out across multiple contexts in ways which we really never saw before. Um, this changes norms of political behavior and international behavior, practices um, on the ground in outcomes in places across the region, both the wars and the non-war zones, um, changing the outcomes and shaping the outcomes of wars in Yemen and Libya, Syria, um, but also changing the course of transitions in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Bahrain, and others. To the degree that uh, the chapter concludes that it is virtually impossible to tell any domestic politics story without having an international dimension to it. International relations is everything. Um, but in this case, it's only one of the things. And what we wanted to do was to not, in this chapter, was not to assert the primacy of the international, but to always question the connections in both directions between the international and the domestic. Uh, instead of comparative politics, where you have a series of cases that you compare to one another, placing all of the cases within a unified political field in which patterns of intervention and political norms have changed dramatically in a very short time. Um, this includes the diffusion of protests. The Arab Spring itself was a clear example of the outward diffusion of protest from the domestic to the international. The response to the Arab uprisings was a pattern of cooperation among autocrats in many cases as they found ways to cooperate to prevent the diffusion of protest moves from the outside in. And so what the chapter really tries to do is to summarize what we've learned about these changing patterns of connections between the international and the domestic. That connects nicely to another chapter on militaries and armed violence. Um, and uh, and uh, not, well, 
of armed groups and the use of violence. I'm sorry, uh, armed violence seems a bit redundant. Um, so this chapter took an interesting approach. We asked them to talk about civil wars, and they came back and said, no, that doesn't capture what's really happening in the region. Because what's most interesting from their perspective was the ways in which the lines between state-sanctioned violence and insurgent and rebel violence have blurred. Many states across the region, their use of violence is increasingly in involving non-state actors. Think of the Syrian regime and its reliance on, uh, on the IRGC, on Hezbollah, on Shia militias, um, on its own loyalist militias. And then on the other side, um, non-state actors frequently and increasingly rely upon direct or indirect support from state actors. Think about the arming of the Syrian opposition, of the Libyan armed groups. Um, so they, they argued that the distinction between state and non-state had broken down. The use of violence had become a pervasive weapon, which was used in similar and different ways by state and non-state actors. Um, Within the chapter, they did look at the role of official state militaries, which were obviously important in the outcomes of many of the transitions in terms of whether you saw a military coup or did not see a military coup. Did the militaries defect and join protesters or did they not? But they also looked at the internal divisions within militaries the differences between the, the interests and the organizations of the military, the police, the muhabarat, and their relationships with power, with citizens, and with each other, which were, as we see, sometimes cooperative, sometimes conflictual, but rarely resembling the ordered hierarchy of the classic Viberian state. Um, finally, uh, this chapter uh, looked at uh, the jihadist insurgent groups and the Islamist insurgent groups such as the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda and placing them within this broader, once again, both domestic and international context and looking at those connections between international jihad and local insurgencies and how they evolved um, in interaction with themselves. Um, and here, one of the key points that they wanted to make was to de-exceptionalize Sunni Islamist jihadism, incorporating Shia Islamist movements and uh, Iran's sponsorship of such militias, um, but also um, non-Islamist uh, patterns of um, transnational volunteerism, armed groups, and the like. So looking at violence in a genuinely comparative transnational and cross-national way. That chapter then intersects with the chapter on Islam and Islamist politics, um, which again looks at things such as uh, the Muslim Brotherhood all the way out to Al Qaeda in the Islamic State, but once again de exceptionalizing them and trying to place them within this broader context of thinking about political action, behavior, and norms. So, one of the key questions motivating this chapter is the question of how significant do we think religion is as a motivator of action? Do we think of these groups as religiously motivated, as somehow different in an ontological way from other political actors following some sort of script dictated by religion? Or do we think of them as strategic actors involved within particular conflicts, whether electoral or armed? Um, in which religion is something which, uh, which, which motivates them, which gives them ideological purpose, but fundamentally is part of general strategic behavior. Um, the chapter looks at questions such as why Islamists had or didn't have advantages in elections or, at, or advantages on the battlefield. Was there something distinctive about Islamist groups which made them better at fighting in places like Syria, Libya, and Yemen? Or was this simply a function of their ability to attract great power or regional power sponsorship and the like? Um, and this chapter also really makes a, a very concerted effort to, um, to compare Sunni and Shia Islamism and not to exceptionalize or most importantly in the post 9-11 uh, context to pathologize uh, Islamist politics as something which is which is uh, seen as fundamentally different or um, you know or non-modern or anything like that. So all of this, those those three chapters then 
each approach similar questions in different ways, and we really pushed the authors of these chapters to engage with each other to find where specific literatures, such as the literature on rebel governance or the literature on Islamist politics, intersected and disagreed or agreed with the literatures on international relations, state formation, um, and the like. So, this book as a whole is largely aimed at American political science and American political scientists, even though it engaged uh, scholars from the region and from Europe. And I think that the, the next step in all of this, and what we hope will be the next step, is that uh, this engages more deeply and broadly with the scholarship about the region from the region. And that's why we're absolutely delighted that the Arab Center has agreed to translate uh, the book into Arabic. Um, one of the things we learned here was that there's a special issue coming out of Siesta uh, Tarabia uh, uh, on political science political science scholarship uh, within the Arab world. We're very keen to compare notes um, on that. One area where I think there might be great uh, opportunities for collaboration um, is related to the final chapter that I want to discuss on public opinion, um, where we've seen a tremendous growth of scientific survey, public opinion survey research um, on the Middle East, which has created an enormous volume of open access, publicly available data, which people can and do use to inform their scholarship on an enormously wide range of issues um, around the Middle East, social, political, economic, and the like. Um, and I can hardly begin to count the number of articles that are submitted to and published in journals now drawing on the open access research of, uh, of the Arab barometer. Uh, we've learned about the Arab Index, which uh, is produced here at the Arab Center, also producing high quality uh, public opinion survey research. It seems to me an excellent opportunity for more collaborative research, comparing the findings of these surveys filling in gaps where one survey worked and the other didn't, and finding ways to really try and build on this common enterprise and produce a scholarship about the Middle East, uh, which fully brings in scholars both within and outside of the Middle East. And with that, I will turn it back over to our esteemed uh, collaborator and uh, moderator, Basil. Thank you, thank you so much, Mark. Two things to flag before we open the Q&A, I, I think, about the book. First of all, this intentional effort to make it methodologically diverse. Because we, people who have been working in Middle East politics, have always been known as people who use qualitative methods. But of course, the younger generation and the way the discipline has been moving entails uh, more quantitative. And I think this, this was done fantastically. I mean, even in the chapter on sectarianism, where we showed how much quantitative methods uh, can be useful and productive. The other important thing, and this is really for students, is that throughout the chapters, there is really engagement with theories that are broadly used in, uh, in the discipline in comparative politics and, and IR. And I think this is very important because we should, those of us who work on the Middle East and Middle East politics should always remind ourselves we're not on our, our, on our own planet. And we need to address bigger debates in, in, in the discipline to be, taken, uh, to be taken seriously. I have a couple of questions from the social media. I'll start with these, and then we'll open it up for the uh, audience. The first question is, what has happened to politics uh, after the Arab Spring? Uh, uh, this is one of the questions. Uh, the other one, what has happened to the Arab state after the popular uprisings? Uh, so if any one of you would like to address these before we open to the audience. The, the first question is, what has happened to politics? In general, yeah. And the second question is, what has happened to the Arab state? Yeah. Your choice. Uh, those are the easiest questions I've ever heard about the Middle East. I mean, give, me, give us something hard. <laughs> well... I'll just say two things. I think politics is as complicated as ever, but if there's one trend that we know about is that, as Mark mentioned earlier, the boundary between domestic and international politics in many cases has dissolved to the point of being non-existent. So when we think about, say, politics in Iraq or politics in Lebanon or politics even in Jordan and politics in much of the Gulf, uh, politics in Sudan. 
it's not really the politics, for instance, of Sudan. It's politics in Sudan as being driven by both Sudanese and non-Sudanese actors and vectors and currents and movements. Um, I think that would be a fruitful object to consider uh, when thinking about how politics fundamentally has changed in ways over the last generation and particularly over the last decade. There's always been a permeability of national boundaries between domestic and the international. I think what's changed is that now we see it. And with the advent of digital technologies and instant communication and, the, and, and more profuse flows of money and capital, I think that those kinds of outside-in influences become a lot easier to see. Um, and I think that's one thing that we should keep in mind, that there are very few domestic politics anymore that are ever truly domestic. And in some cases, maybe the best starting point to think about politics is actually the, is at the regional level and then boring into the domestic. Um, Jillian, why don't you tell us about the Arab state? <laughs> Um, well, I, that, that was actually going to be my point, um, so I echo that, that I think that's one of the takeaways from the volume it, in all the chapters is exactly that, that, that we can't just look at these states as standalone units and what happens internal to them. We probably never could and should have, but we're pushing in a lot of these literatures uh, against that. Um, on the Arab uprisings, again, you know, the Arab state after the Arab uprisings, uh, yeah, massive question. I think the one thing is is to not think of um, the uprisings as these isolated moments of rupture followed by these sort of stable periods. And so for me, thinking about the state, uh, uprisings were obviously a, a serious disruption. But if you look at a longer period, which all the chapters actually, as Mark mem mem uh, emphasized, takes this longer historical view. Thinking about protests and the uprising over this longer historical view, you see ongoing challenges to the state in from every direction. And so the uprisings are one particularly concentrated period that, of course, is extraordinary and merits thinking on its own. But thinking about the state um, isn't simply you know, was it challenged and did it survive and did it survive in a slightly different form? But the sort of ongoing maneuvering, efforts to silence dissent, efforts to outflank it, uh, and likewise, actors, you know, trying to challenge the state, maybe not in street politics, but in, in other venues. And so I think thinking about the state and state maintaining is an ongoing process as opposed to something that has, you know, ruptures and either it survives or doesn't survive. And so I think that's a fruitful theme of uh, that comes through in many of the chapters. I would just add that you know across the region, what I see is that in response to the Arab uprisings, there's been a kind of extreme autocratic backlash, which has closed down many of the opportunities for political participation in many of these countries. Out of fear of the next wave of uprisings, you've seen um, mass campaigns of arrests and repression, the hollowing out or crushing of civil society, uh, increased uh, control over the media, increased use of state violence against um, protesters or activists or pretty much anyone. And I think what this has, and this of course has been combined with um, massive increases in deprivation and grievances so that across much of the region right now, uh, you see situations which in, for at least as it appears to me, uh, are far more politically explosive than they were in 2010, um, in which there are far fewer institutional uh, uh, arrangements by which regimes might be able to contain or diffuse those grievances through elections, through uh, accountability mechanisms, through anything of the like, even letting off steam uh, through allowing editorial op-eds or, um, or contained protests is largely off the table now. And so, I, so when you ask what's happened with, uh, with politics, um, politics have largely been suppressed, but grievances have escalated. And so I tend to be quite, um, uh, well, pessimistic or optimistic, depending on your point of view, um, about what's likely to happen uh, in the coming years. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much uh, for such uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, I have two uh, observations. The first one, 
it looks that the most of the chapters based on, uh, as Dr. Basil mentioned, uh, variety of methodologies. Uh, it may, may be a case studies looking for into political Islam, uh, uh, protest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is there any chapters looking into comparative perspective, especially from the failed transition in the Middle East comparing to other transition uh, in other regions like Latin America, Western Sahara, uh, Eastern Europe? Um, and this is actually, it's important because that will put the political theories into perspective, especially modernization theory, BA theories. Dr. Azmi has a very interesting chapter on his book on transition comparing Egypt and Chile in Latin America from BA perspective, a bu a bu bureaucratic authoritarian uh, perspective. Uh, this is actually will be very interesting uh, uh, to see. And my second observation on on the concept of civil war. There is a lot of literature now that uh, the concept is not applicable anymore because civil war is now regional wars. And this is exactly the situation in the Middle East. Look into Syria, into Libya, into Yemen, is not civil war anymore. It's more a regional wars, and that will change the whole perspective into how look into details and the actors and the landscape of the political actors. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rod. One, uh, those are those are great observations, and I, I guess my answer to both questions is yes. Um, I, all the chapters very explicitly and intentionally do exactly because you're you're completely right about the importance of cross-regional comparison, and so. The, almost every chapter does engage in, in those kinds of comparisons, because I agree that it's, I, I think that scholars of the Middle East have tended to have tunnel vision and only compare Arab states to other Arab states, and we really pushed our authors to uh, not do that and to, and to look at cross-regional comparisons. And then, yes, the, the civil wars into regional wars, this is a major theme of both the military's chapter and the international relations chapter, because you're absolutely right about, uh, about what's happened there. It's impossible to really look at these as self-contained wars when there's so many external actors involved in shaping the balance of power, the outcomes, the ideologies, and the like. So, so excellent observations. Thank you. I think uh, one thing also to add is uh, this whole issue of the ethics of research, particularly uh, war-torn societies. And I think there is a recognition in the discipline now. Uh, you flagged Sarah's fantastic piece. How do you do research? Uh, there is a lot of research fatigue uh, among uh, uh, constituencies here, but also especially places that have suffered from civil war and refugees and so on. I think the discipline now is much more aware about the ethics of this. Dr. Abdul Wahab. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for uh, Mark and the panel uh, and the authors for this uh, interesting book, uh, which I'm looking forward to read it very closely, uh, because I think uh, what uh, PROMEPS are doing is what we are trying also to do here. That's why I'm seriously thinking of a hostile takeover bit. <laughs> but uh, what I am uh, curious to know is uh, how uh, substantive the rethinking is, because uh, when we have been looking uh, at the literature in the last few years, usually every couple of decades there is a, a retrospective which says, we did this, and we should do this, and we should do this, and and that's all they said. That n nobody shows us in practice how this thing is done, uh, or uh, offers models of how uh, it is done. Uh, and so I, uh, well, my my main point is that uh, uh, I don't think that there should be a, a science, political science of the Middle East. There should be good political science. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I think we mentioned Almod's uh, yesterday uh, famous traditional division between political science for the advanced societies and what he called the uh, uh, esoteric or exotic and uncouth uh, <laughs> outside. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, for example, if we look at the point, some of the points you raised, 
uh, about uh, specific cases where uh, there is a, a specific politics, for example. Uh, the question is not uh, as uh, probably said, or maybe in addition to what has been said, that we look at how authoritarianism has been shifting or changing, but also looking at the interesting phenomenon of why the uh, the authoritarian regimes are so insecure. They are not, as uh, the literature was to say, uh, uh, well adapted or they are product of the culture, or at least product of the circumstance. They are very worried. That's why they are so violent. Uh, they think that there is so much opposition. And uh, the opposition we have seen, for example, especially in the, uh, in the uprisings, uh, uh, was uh, uh, the, the early uprising and the second wave uprising is interesting for its audacity and and uh, and the uh, their knowledge. For example, in Libya, people know that Gaddafi would do anything, and he did actually. He he used uh, air uh, airplanes to bomb Tahrir Square in in Tripoli. They know that the Assads have already done something outrageous in in Hama and they knew what they are capable of. Uh, but they didn't care. They were really determined, and they were united. And also, we see in the, in the next, in the second, for example, uh, the anti-sectarian of the supposed sectarians. The Shia in Iraq were, uh, were uh, uh, revolting against the people who says we are the Shia, we are the representative of the Shia. Uh, and, and they knew also that these guys, don't have any uh, red lines. And they did, actually. They massacred people. They targeted uh, the, the, the uh, leaders of the resistance in very uh, meticulous and methodic way. So I think uh, when we're looking at this thing, we all look, you, you rightly mentioned the international uh, uh, community and its response. And I think we, I had some exchanges with you about that. <laughs> Uh, at one point uh, about the Obama uh, uh, policies, uh, where I, uh, I have written a paper saying, uh, titled, When Genocides Becomes a Lesser Evil. And uh, in what happened in Syria was genocide uh, worse than what's happening in Ukraine today by the same uh, Russians. That's why uh, uh, I, I called what's happening in Ukraine the, the Arabization of Europe. Uh, there is a, a tolerance of what people like Sisi or uh, uh, Ben Zaid or uh, Assad are doing uh, in a, a perception in the minds of this is the insecurity also of the, uh, of the West. They think that this is maybe the easier solution. Uh, genocide, keeping this purpose, is better than. Uh, 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 I, uh, I wanted to add just a small uh, thing about uh, also violence, because I have, we have a, an interesting case relating to Sudan, but also to the UK. We have a, a, an acquaintance of ours who is, uh, is a communist person who actually leads the communist party branch in the UK. He left uh, Sudan because he was against the Islamists, and he was living there. And uh, of course, his kids were brought up in England, not knowing much about Sudan. And three of them joined ISIS. <laughs> one of them was killed, and one of them is a notorious guy, the Beatle, who is now in America. Uh, now, how do you, how does our uh, repertoire of, of analysis find this? These are guys. The family was communist. Uh, they were educated at home in certain ways. They were educated in England, in English schools. They have nothing to do with <laughs> Some of them don't even uh, speak Arabic well. Uh, how did this happen? I think you have to look. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe we should all engage. Uh, yes, that. Abdel Wahab, that, that, that's, a, that's a very good set of questions you raise. And 
I think uh, we would all agree, and I think many other political scientists would agree, that in order for there to be not just a political science, but a, a good political science of the Middle East, uh, we need to have a repertoire of ideas and concepts that match the realities we're seeing on the ground. Um, and you raised a very good point about one reality that many of us often take for granted, which is that if you think about the degree of repression and backlash that many regimes and states have expressed towards social forces and civil society over the last 10 years, there's a, there's a nastiness to it that didn't exist before um, that may reflect a heightened degree of uncertainty that these regimes feel, even though structurally speaking, one might think that they would be more secure than ever. I mean, we're in an era where the, uh, the, we're, we're likely entering the twilight of American hegemony. Uh, may perhaps, I don't want to make any lifetime predictions, but for the foreseeable future, it is highly unlikely the U.S. will ever engage in nation building in the Middle East again for the purpose of overthrowing regimes or building democracy. So most regional governments don't face that kind of existential threat. Uh, authoritarianism has been reconfigured since the Arab Spring in ways in which even in Tunisia, we see a severe decline in democratic gains. So that invokes the interesting question, why then would non-democratic rulers feel more insecure now? Right? Why not less insecure, particularly given the increased popularity of not just Russia, but the Chinese model of political economy and development, where one asks no political questions and just hopes for economic prosperity? I think that at least speaking for my community of scholars who study authoritarianism, I think much of the answer lies in, 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 in both a contingent and an historical factor. The historical factor is that there are no more ideologies left. Right? There's no more true Baathist ideology left. There's no Arab nationalism. And I think in, in, in most parts of the region, Islamism is no longer a serious contender to replace governments any longer. And one of the things that ideologies provide is a kind of cognitive framework for ruling parties to provide a sense of security and normalcy to their political orders. I think that with the replacement of ideological regimes with personalistic ones, where politics becomes so beholden to the whims of a singular ruler, it's much easier for paranoia and fear, particularly of overthrow, to infect the political system. I think that is the historical factor. I think the contingent factor is that while the Arab Spring, as Jillian said, by no means was some unique, remarkable moment of protest, since protests are as ubiquitous to the region as anything else, I think one one fungible lesson that many rulers learn from the Arab Spring is that if you let an uprising get out of control, you will lose power. So the stakes are quite high. And I think that some of the viciousness we saw uh, in the repressive crackdowns that, that typified many regional states in the mid-2010s, uh, even in states not known uh, for decades for their for their for for crackdowns like Morocco and Jordan, for instance, reflected uh, a contingent insecurity driven by the idea that they had seen what happens if there is a real people power movement and if an uprising gets too big. Before, it was a hypothetical. It was a, a hopes riot that had to be contained. It was a pro-Palestinian protest that had to be weathered. It was a uh, an anti-American protest that, 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 that inaugurate a degree of instability. But outside a few uh, traumatizing cases like Algeria, most other regional countries understood protests, but I think didn't understand what it would mean to see rulers have to be have, lose power in the face of, uh, of mass mobilization. And I think a lot of that, in, uh, the, the insecurity that you invoke, I think it reflects that contingent understanding. Now they, they, know, they know the stakes. And I think that accounts for some of the, just the nastiness and the viciousness that we see in some of the repressive campaigns of the last decade that we didn't necessarily see before, except for a handful of the worst offenders um, in the region. Um, I need to use time economically. Uh, uh, Dr. Amal and uh, Dr. Aisha. And then I will go to Dr. Ibrahim and Dr. Omar. Uh, thank you, Basil, uh, Mark, Gillian, and Sean. 
uh, this has been a very animated discussion. And as you were talking about how the project evolved and how you configured the chapters, I was comparing notes with a parallel project uh, a couple of years after the um, initial phases of the, of the uprisings. Uh, Oxford University Press um, contacted my colleague Jens Hansen, asking for a for a handbook on on kind of contemporary history to capture what was going on. Um, I came on board, and the most difficult part was first, as historians, and I think this is where I was comparing notes. What's my starting? Where, where is my starting point? And also, what do I do with interdisciplinarity in this big project? We ended up with 33 chapters. Uh, the, the title uh, evolved to be uh, the Oxford Handbook uh, for, the contemporary, for Contemporary Middle Eastern and North African History. So we wanted contemporary and history in, this, in the title. And um, what was more difficult than chasing after 33 authors was to create titles and put chapters together in a systematic way that made sense. So I was comparing notes between our table of content and your table of content, and I have this question, how and where does interdisciplinarity feature? Uh, where's environment, labor, uh, media, gender, and youth? Uh, Mark, I think you did mention something about gender. So I would like to know in what ways you were able to incorporate these themes in the 12 chapters you had. And uh, for us, we wanted to make sure at the time that the Palestinian question is central to how we were uh, organizing the, the handbook and, and seeking contributions. And I'm wondering also, uh, where does the Palestinian question feature uh, in, in such a book? Thank you. Well, thank you first, and uh, congratulations on, on this flagship uh, publication. Uh, I would like to go back to another security, insecurity rather, and touch on the issue of the zero-sum game in politics, which has dominated the politics in, in the Middle East and uh, North Africa for quite a long time. And uh, this uh, zero-sum uh, game has, uh, has been at the center of politics, both at the uh, state levels and, uh, and the, uh, at the level of the uh, society, uh, different society players, especially after the, uh, the Arab Spring. So we have noticed in the region that uh, this zero-sum gun politics has increased and has complicated conflicts both between states and in, within the states. So I would like to, to know if you have touched on this concept and concept, and if you've compared it to um, the practice of win-win politics, which, which uh, you know, uh, obviously is, is missing in the region. Thank you. Um. Great, thanks for these questions. Um, uh, so Dr. Rama, the, uh, the comparison to the earlier handbooks, one thing we really wanted to do with this was rather than have like a lot of individual chapters, um, we really wanted to force uh, multiple scholars from, the, from these thematic clusters to engage with each other um, in order to produce a collective chapter um, and then to have them do that, then run that through the gamut of all of the other chapters to try and uh, you know produce something which would be uh, you know hopefully uh, this kind of collective enterprise um, and. So I think that's one of the biggest differences from the uh, kind of the handbook uh, model. Um, whether it produced, uh, you know, kind of different outcomes, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see what uh, what reviewers and readers uh, think about it. Um, but in terms of your question about interdisciplinarity and, and issues like uh, gender, labor, youth, and, and that, we really made a concerted effort to have those run through all the chapters where they were relevant um, to, and it was something that we as editors would flag. We would say, you know, th this seems like an area where you could 
could talk about research ethics. This seems like an area where you could talk about gender, you could talk about youth. So we didn't want to force it into, into chapters where it didn't seem appropriate or relevant, but I think you'll see when you read it that um, a lot of these cross-cutting thematics, um, and that, that includes also media and political communications and the like, um, we, we re you'll, you'll see that those run through uh, the chapters as, as best we possibly can. Um, and then finally, the Palestinian question, um, that's mostly in the international relations chapter and in the uh, comparative uh, militaries and, and armed violence uh, chapters. Yeah, I could just add really quickly, the, um, um, the chapters do draw on different disciplines. And even POMEPS, our project on Middle East political science, we've abandoned political science as the required entree. And so it's like anyone working on politics from whatever discipline is really part of our conversation. And I think the chapters reflect that. On gender, we initially envisioned a chapter on gender, and that group decided to disband itself because it didn't want to be compartmentalized. So we did take particular care that there's discussion of gender woven throughout. Labor is pretty central. Um, media pops up in different places. But on the gender issue, we were very conscious to make sure that was you know, in every issue and not just in a separate you know, one discussion. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, everyone, for uh, all the hard work you put into this. Um, and before I ask my question, actually, uh, a friend is watching online, and he sent me this question asking why uh, there uh, isn't any of the project leaders from the region. Uh, that, for example, the editors are, the region has no voices, for example, in the book design or the outline or any of this. So I thought I should, <laughs> I should share this with you uh, as it came to me from a friend who's watching online on the, uh, the editors of the book. And now my question actually is, uh, Amal uh, touched on it, which is, uh, I don't see in the, um, in the book uh, outline, the chapters, anything on colonialism, satrap colonialism. Uh, I think this is something that, due to its importance in the region and shaping the history of the region, that at least would, have, would appear in the, uh, in the outline, not just being like somewhere in one of the chapters. I mean, because this is like shaped the politics of the region for, for decades, uh, that I don't see it. And the third thing, which is uh, actually related to my bias to my own field about conflict resolution, I look at the uh, outline, it looks very depressing, honestly. <laughs> it's about the sectarianism and authoritarianism and displacement and uh, like really, really hard. You know the outline. Where is the resolution? Where is the hope? Where is the you know that appears in the outline? I don't see it. Uh, I look, is this the political science of the region? Honestly, no, no mention of settler colonialism or or anything in the in the outline of the book, and there is no hope or that it's all like these really hard, harsh words about migration and displacement and authoritarianism and sectarianism and. So this is uh, a bit like caught my attention, so I thought I would share with this with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bessel. And uh, just first, congratulations for the uh, seminal work. And uh, second, uh, I have two quick questions. One on what, uh, actually, Gillian, I think uh, what you mentioned, uh, in the sense that the protests may fail, but the, govern the government or the regime may change. Uh, just by competitive uh, analysis, I, uh, the f my latest uh, uh, book, Bullets to Ballots, we found that the, um, if the insurgency started um, and then there's a transformation to nonviolence by the non-state side, um, the focus was initially on the non-state side and its behavioral, ideological, organizational transformations. But what we found is that the state side actually changes, even if the insurgency fails. Uh, it, it changes if there are draws or uh, if there is a defeat of the state side. But even in failures, there are changes institutional. The factions are not the same. The hawks becomes doves, uh, e even with failure, with victory of the state side. So I was wondering if you found uh, you know, any of that in terms of when it's a protest, when it's a nonviolent uh, conflict. The other question is what Mark has mentioned on the the, let's say, the combat capacity or the combat effectiveness on the jihadist uh, dimension and why is that. We did a post podcast on how ISIS fights, and my findings was 
basically it's not religion, it's not ideology, it's not the capacity to mobilize, it's mainly a set of, uh, in that particular organization, um, experience, so Darwinism was there, was there, and a set of TTPs, of uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that they applied so cleverly to uh, pull a series of uh, upsets. But in, in your case, was there something else? Thank you. Great. Um, so, Omar, uh, on uh, how ISIS fights, great book. Thank you for writing it. Uh, it was super. Um, I would say that the chapter uh, that um, the, that the uh, that addresses that. Um, actually, the two different chapters that address that, the Islamism chapter and the military's chapter, I don't think it advances an argument of its own. It more, it more surveys uh, the different positions on it. And um, uh, I, I tend to uh, agree with you personally, but um, you'll, have to, you'll have to see how the, the kind of that, those collective groups um, come at it. But the, the, the debate between those who center religion and ideology versus those who center strategic adaptation, I think is central uh, to, to those chapters. Um, and then um, on insurgency, changing the states and the regime, absolutely. I mean, I think this is key to the authoritarianism chapter. Sean can talk about it. Um, but very much this reconfiguration of, of the political field and of the state is something which was, I think, central to a lot of the chapters. Um, so Ibrahim, um, yes, there's no scholars from the region uh, among the editors, but every single, uh, every single uh, chapter had at least one, often more than one, sc uh, scholar from the region. Uh, several of them were group leaders. Basel was one of them. Um, and so this is, I mean, I, I, I can see how it looks that way, but I don't, think that's, I don't think it's a serious problem with the book. Colonialism features heavily in almost every chapter because, as I said, one of the prominent themes running through the book is uh, the legacies of history. This is central in the chapter on political economy of development, on authoritarianism, um, and the like. And your question of where's the hope, I don't see it. Do you? <laughs> um, you know, this is, a, this is an attempt to look at the political science of the region as it is and the region as it is. And um, at least my, my perspective is that uh, the Arab uprisings were a moment of tremendous hope where it seemed like everything was possible. And since then, regimes did everything they could to crush that hope and have created a situation which is characterized by mass uh, displacement and refugees, multiple civil wars, uh, the mass imprisonment and torture and displacement displacement of, of activists and ordinary citizens, reconfigured authoritarianism, which has snuffed out opportunities for, um, for meaningful political change through institutional channels, massive economic setbacks, which have wiped out the gains of previous decades. And so, you know, it would, it would be nice to, I mean, the, I, I suppose the hope in, in the volume comes from the fact that political scientists are doing a better job of studying it. But in terms of the political conditions of the region today, um, I personally find it very difficult to identify hope. Where I've seen the hope in my own work and in my own experience has been in the people themselves, has been in, uh, in the youth, in the, um, you know, kind of the intellectual ferment, in the frustrations that can hopefully be channeled into creative forms of protest. I look at what's happening in Iran right now as very much of a piece with what's happened in Sudan, uh, what's happened in, in across the region, 2011, 2018. I don't see what's happening in Iran as any different. It's driven, I mean, obviously there's local specificities, but it's driven by the same combinations of highly autocratic, repressive government and massive economic um, and, uh, and political closure. And so, you know, the, the hope, I, I mean, I still believe that over the long term, uh, there's tremendous hope based in the human development of the region, but that's not what the region looks like right now, unfortunately. I wish it did. Um, and uh, so maybe, maybe in the second edition of the book, we'll be able to find the green shoots. I, I certainly hope so. <laughs> and thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> yeah, no, no, thank you for bringing that up. So I actually, so I agree, settler colonialism does run through, you know, through many of the chapters, and particularly the one on migration and displacement has extensive discussion of it, sustained discussion of it. I think there is hope uh, in the sense that the book highlights, so yes, states have disproportionate resources to crush dissent, 
But the book brings forth the sort of creativity and agency of all kinds of peoples in all kinds of ways to constantly try to push back. That's why the states still feel insecure, because the potential is there. And I think a lot of people still feel that, even if this moment is one to pull back. You saw in a lot of cases around the 2013, 2014, with the emergence of ISIS, some activist groups saying, well, let's, let's hold back. Maybe the alternatives aren't looking so good. But that didn't mean that was gone. So I think there's that, they, highlighting the agency of people, their creativity, for me, runs throughout the book. That doesn't mean I think things are going to look great in the next five years. But that's, you know, that human potential is really captured. Aisha, I'm sorry we lost your question. Um, Sean and Mark can correct me. I don't think anyone uses the term zero-sum game particularly. But I think what that captures is a theme that exists in many of the chapters, in the sort of back and forth between regimes and challenges by oppositions, between groups, et cetera. So I think in spirit that's there. But it's someone, one of the chapters might have used it. Um, I'm not positive. Um, uh, on the editors of the book, yes, Basil is here. He wasn't an editor. One of the things is uh, doing an edited volume is an extraordinary amount of work. And a lot of our scholars from the region are junior scholars. And so it simply wouldn't have been a good idea to saddle them with something that's going to take two years out of their life chasing down academics. So that was something we did actually uh, think about, was making this uh, to um, help them agenda set theories and to bring their voices forward uh, substantively and not have them do the work of the labor of editing. Uh, and then just to ask Omar, thank you for this. That's not discussed in the protest chapter because we just chose these three themes of affect, uh, political effects of protest besides what you know, the success failure model and um, routine protest. It's, it's in the Islam chapter, Islamist politics chapter. Okay. I know I'm running out of time, but I still have four questions. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, and actually, I'm looking forward to reading this book, actually. It, uh, it, it seems it's a, a, great, a great read. Uh, I, have, I have, like, four questions. The first one is kind of a lot of com the commentators touched on, upon it. And it is, there, it seems like there are two bodies of uh, political science research uh, on MENA. One which is uh, written in Arabic, and one which is uh, written in English, and I think this uh, particularly is related to Mark Lynch. So, how can you think we can bridge uh, that gap or that chasm? And it has been for a long time that uh, the research from the Middle East is used as raw material in the Western academic circles. So. If that, we can change anything about that. The second is, uh, I, I think it is uh, more related to uh, uh, Julia, which is, do we, did, have we seen any new contentious mechanisms or contentious uh, repertoires in the Arab Spring uh, protests, and in particular in the, 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 the second phase? How are they challenging the state? Are there new ways of dissent? And, and that's the second one. And the third one, which is, uh, I think, is more related to Sean, which is uh, how do you approach the personalist autocrat? Because if you look back at uh, post Arab uh, Spring, you always see a personalistic element to the autocrats. So do you see it as? kind of dichotomous, there's personalistic, and there's uh, maybe military or something else, or it is continuous. Thank you so much. Yeah, so a couple of people, a couple of people have mentioned hope. Um, so that was kind of my question. Um, I'm thinking about the kind of the debates between people who are optimistic and, and pessimistic. There's kind of a continuum of pessimism and, and optimism. Um, and I'd, I'd like for you guys to comment on that. I know you don't have a crystal ball, what's going to happen in the next five years or 10 years or 20 years. But I'm, in particular, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on the potential for these uh, loosely fragmented oppositional movements abroad that have organized themselves loosely uh, outside of their native countries. 
I think there are probably multiple questions in there, but maybe my question is how worried should the regimes be about those, um, about those oppositional movements and, and what potential do they have to create substantive change in the short term and long term? Hello, I, I have two quick questions. The first one, who is the public of your book? This is a, just, a, I'm wondering, who is the public that you are targeting with this book? Because I think specifying that maybe cl will clarify many things in your, in, your, in your approach. The second one is more uh, directed to Sean. To what extent do you really think that the way the regimes are trying to crack down uh, all these protests are really new or, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we know that, uh, I know that person that you are a specialist of Jordan, do you think that things are really now much, uh, early? the regime is more authoritarian in his way of cracking down uh, any type of protest as it was in Zarqa or Ma'an in the 1980s? Just I'm wondering about that. Thank you. Uh, I am wondering if your volume came out with any interesting comparative note between the Arab countries, Iran, and Turkey uh, concerning precisely the business of uh, protest and, and autocracy. And, and does your field still f think that it makes sense to speak of the Arab world as a political unit? I mean, what what connection or what sense is there to speak of these countries as a unit other than they all speak Arabic? Thank you. Great, thanks for all these great questions. I'll try to leave some of them for, for Jillian and for Sean. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, so Abdul Karim, who's the public of the book? I would say it's real. This is really aimed at an academic audience. This is really aimed at other political scientists, both scholars of the Middle East. But we also really hope that it's read by general political scientists who want to learn what is happening in the Middle East. Um, so absolutely. And this relates back to your question about English, Arabic. I would add French um, literature there, especially on the Maghreb. Um, and and here, you know, it's it's you know. Your point is a very good one about how often this is used as the way you put it, raw material. But I don't really see it quite like that. I mean, all uh, all intellectual engagement is is in some form. If you're doing political theory, are you using Marx and Hegel as raw material? If I read Dr. Azmi on the state, uh, is that a dialogue with him, or is that me using him as raw material? So, so I, I do. I think that there are many situations like the ones you describe, um, and then there are many that are not. And we're hoping that we're the, we're that what we're doing doing is of the type where we're fully um, we're fully engaging with scholarship from the region on its own terms, um, not just as material to be used, but as ideas that are being generated from the region that uh, that we test and we incorporate into our re into our work and the like. And that that's that was what the goal should be. Uh, Lisa Anderson is leading a large project on research ethics in the Middle East, and uh, this is one of the pillars of that project: is trying to find ways to ensure that intellectual exchange. Is, is, you know, done between equals, not in an exploitative or uh, kind of extractive mode, as you describe. But it's, it's, I would say that the, the, there's, a, there's a large problem, though, which is that, and this is something that we've been speaking with people here at the, at the Institute and the Arab Center um, all weekend, which is that for many American political scientists, they're not aware of what is being published in Arabic. Uh, uh, in, I'm not, and here I'm not talking about the commentary in the op-eds and things like that, which I think we all do follow and use as uh, in, in, in all kinds of ways. I'm talking about the academic journals and that sort of thing, which uh, I think are largely uh, uh, foreign territory. And then, of course, as I said, in the Maghreb, there's a large Francophone literature, which is largely invisible to many of us uh, who are Anglophone, American political scientists. So trying to bridge those gaps is, has been a significant challenge, which relates then to your question about Turkey and Iran. Um, and so when Pomeps first began, uh, it was very Arab-centric. 
Um, and so we've successively tried to branch out and to include Turkish scholars and scholars of Iran. Uh, we do have difficulty dealing with Iranian scholars because of American sanctions, and um, we, we, we literally cannot send students or, or, or junior faculty to Iran because we're not allowed to pay for it, and that's a real problem. Um, but we've been really, really working to bring Turkish scholars and scholars of Turkey in and uh, where we can engage with the Iranian scholarship as well uh, to the best of our to the best of our ability. And like I said a moment ago, um, the uh the um, uh, study of what's happening in Iran right now, and which happened three years ago, and the like, I see as very much, uh, you know, part of the protest chapter, but just part of the story of the Arab Spring. It's a global story. Erdogan in Turkey is a story of global populism and personalization of politics. No different, in my view, in that sense, from Trump or Sisi or uh, uh, Bonsaro or any of the, you know, this kind of rising trend of these global populist uh, autocrats or would-be autocrats. So I think that we're definitely sensitive to the questions you're raising. Um, the last one that I'll engage and then turn it over to, uh, to Jillian, I suppose, um, is this question, does the Arab world make sense? And here, you know, we've been, um, at least I, have been pushing very hard for trans-regional and cross-regional approaches uh, to scholarship. Uh, I actually direct a second project comparable to POMEPS on uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which, we, well, not sub-Saharan, it's Africa. It includes North Africa, trying to do something similar uh, with uh, several other people, and, and we constantly push for trans-regional and cross-regional comparisons uh, with Africa and the Middle East, and that's a major theme, at least in the work that I've been doing and pushing towards um, in recent years. I do think that the Arab world makes sense as a concept uh, when you're talking about these, um, you know, what I, what I called in the book the New Arab Wars, where you have this interventionism, the diffusion of protests during the initial Arab uprisings, the interventionism within those conflicts by uh, Arab regimes. Um, obviously, Turkey is also involved in that. Iran is also involved in that. But it does seem to me that there is some kind of, at least in 2011, there was some kind of unified Arab space where these things were taking place. But no, I, I, I don't believe in reifying it and, uh, and just saying, you know, there's something unique about these Arab states and they should only be compared to each other. So it's an excellent point. But I'll stop there. Um, Jillian? Yeah, thank you. A lot to talk about. Uh, so very briefly again, yeah, Iran and Turkey do exist in, throughout the volume. It's not framed as Arab world at all. Um, the protest chapter actually had an Iranian scholar on it who dropped out because he had other commitments. But his ideas are in there, and we cite his work extensively. Um, uh, new contentious repertoires in the uprisings. I think the one thing that's significantly different um, is the Arab uprisings were the first period, the first massive protests to take place in the smartphone age. And so the, the role of people uploading uh, videos in real time to YouTube, you know, not just the tweeting and Twitter stuff, but I think up uploading thing to, things to YouTube, sharing images um, of large gatherings, by speaking to international audiences directly. I think it's, there's a literature that's emerging significant on social media. Um, so I think that's something that was different in this set of uprises in terms of different contentious repertoires. Um, on the hopes and debates and optimism and pessimism, it, this actually does come up in the protest chapter because we do talk about the role of affect and uh, the, you know, simultaneous hope, like something can change. We saw something can change. It's how do we get there? How do we leverage it? So you have the despair of it f seemingly failed, but whole generations that now see there's a possibility that generations before them thought was just impossible. Um, I can't predict you know, the potential for change, but the potential is there for sure. Um, things can change, and they don't have to change just from opposition movements. Regimes could adopt different policies. Um, will they? I, c I can't say. But I, I think there is tremendous potential for change. Um, I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, because I, I know at the end of a presentation like this, we're all just throwing darts to hit questions randomly. I just let me hit three questions that haven't been addressed yet. Um, 
there has always been a streak of personalism that has characterized many autocracies. So one of the things that the authoritarianism chapter does is say, personalism is not a dichotomous variable. It's a continuous variable. All regimes have some degree of personalism. The question is how much? And when it becomes so large that it overshadows every other institution, that's when you can begin to say, OK, this is no longer a single party state. This is a regime of Assad, for instance. So that's how that chapter deals with that. Um, <clears throat> there was a question on social media uh, that I was just shown that I want to address. And it's a really interesting question about, is there a political economy theory? Does political science give us a theory about grievances, about the economics of grievances, and why grievances sparked the uprisings in 2011 and again in 2019? And the, the, the answer is no, but it's because we are still changing our vocabularies. Uh, one of the reasons is that when we think about material grievances and deprivation, we, I think, are still often entrapped in the language of class. And I think, as some of our colleagues have written about, we've entered an era of classless politics, which is the title of a great book that a colleague of ours, Hashem Salem, has just released. Classless politics means that people have grievances, but they're not motivated by a consciousness about what class they belong to. They're driven by the inequality they see. They're not driven by a grand ideological vision of what economy they want. They're driven by the injustice in their lives, which they want to reverse in the here and now. So there's not a political economy of grievance, per se. There's a moral economy of dignity. And I think that's where a lot of our theories are trying to understand more fully. And that is a flashpoint of what we know, what we don't know, and how do we get traction. And finally, that's partly, I think, the promise of studying new topics in the field, like the mobilization of opposition abroad. I think that understanding transnational dissent and transnational mobilization among anti-regime opposition simultaneous with studying transnational repression is one of the great uh, la uh, untapped frontiers of knowledge that we are all, I think, working on, both in the Middle East and in the West, because we see it happening in real time. And it's something that if there is a uh, volume two or next edition of the book, that will certainly merit its own chapter. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mark, Jillian, Sean, for your generosity, the Arab Center, the Dauha Institute. The whole objective of today was to start a dialogue and to see how we can create synergy between political science of the Middle East and political science from the Middle East. And I think we are off to a great start. Thank you so much, everyone. And we will come back at 12 o'clock for Dr. Lisa Anderson's uh, public lecture. Thank you.